everybody. I'm here today with Hafiz Kareem, who's a very talented young artist here in Singapore. Thank you very much for joining Thank me. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, I did want to start out real quick before we got to the interview, uh, just with a lightning round. Okay. To just warm up a bit. Let's do this. You ready? Go. First question. Artist you admire the most? The most famous artist. Matty Mo. Oh, okay, wait, what, who, who is this? Matty Mo. The one that inspired my moniker. Yeah. He was the most famous artist. Oh. And he's based in Boston. What kind of art does he do? He does a lot of stunt art, conceptual art, anything that does with questions the art, market, art world in general or mm -hmm. branding of oneself. And I find him so smart in the way he thinks about what art could be and how it affects people, in, especially in this technological era. I'm also inspired by that and it influenced my moniker, the next most famous artist. That's where your that's artist right, name <laughs> comes from. I mean, I couldn't be the most famous artist, so I got the next one. That's great. <laughs> I think that's... Oh, okay. All right. Favorite movie? Hidden Figures. Hidden Figure. Okay. The one about NASA. The about computers. about the, the African-American yeah. NASA yeah. engineers, yeah. correct? The computers. I, ha I haven't seen it yet. I know. You should watch it. It's on Netflix. Okay. Picasso or Dali? Mm. My art history friends will kill me. Mm -hmm. Picasso. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> he was good too. He's clever. Yeah, how so? Um, the fact that he knows what the trends are in terms of appropriating, um, obviously, um, techniques from other cultures, like the mask he used. Mm -hmm. He understands when it comes to modern art, it's about reacting to the uh, art period before. Um, the way he thinks about what art could be in the next, in the future, that was inspiring to me. The way he culturally appropriated things? Yeah, I mean, like, like, what did you mean by that? I mean, since I'm like more considered to be of an appropriation artist, mm -hmm. right? Taking stuff from other uh, classical periods. Um, the fact that he's able to do it and then make us understand about primitivism and when talk, talk about his works, the four women, then the brothel. Piece, right. Right. Yeah. So he's uh, the fact that the mask is incorporated in the figures, and I find it interesting that um, he's putting in different influences inside that one piece. What do you do in your free time? Yeah. You nap? <laughs> I need to nap. That's important. People tend to forget about naps. Okay? I'm all about naps. I don't care. But you shouldn't need a nap if you're getting plenty of sleep at night anyway, right? Oh, I don't get enough sleep at night. Okay, so you don't sleep at night very much. And obviously, I play my games. You play what games? I play, my, I play games. Games. Video games. That's why you're up at night. You're a gamer. Mm -hmm. See, gamers end up having some sort of weird insomnia <laughs> issues guilty. because they're just up. Guilty. Have you ever seen a ghost? No, thankfully. I want to. No, I want to see a ghost. That, that. <laughs> that mansion down there is haunted. No, don't do you see it? Do you see, do you see the mansion? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that no. is, that's scary, isn't it? Are you freaking out right now? No, thankfully not. <laughs> Aliens. Are they here? Are they here? I think so. You think so? <laughs> They're living among us. Have you been following kind of all the yes, news? Yes, I have, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting to follow, but I have no, I have no opinion on it. It's probably just Chinese drones. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> all right, okay, that was the end of the lightning round, which was, it wasn't super lightning, not bad. but reasonably yeah. quick. Obviously, you're a, a talented young artist here. Uh, you started to develop a bit of a claim to fame with your uh, yeah, fame, I think you, yeah. you got 15,000 yeah, yeah. followers yeah. here in Singapore. That's pretty good for Singapore, so, yeah. especially for an artist. For an artist and someone who just started like a year ago. Really? Wait. I, I started during that first lockdown in May in 2020. Wait, so that was the, when you started doing this particular kind of art? And I started the next most famous artist. As in the collage art and the, with the NFTs? No, the NFTs was only in March this year. But as far as creating art creating digitally, art, the visitors, visitors of Singapore mm -hmm. collection started out in May 2020 when I was bored at home. Right. Can't go out, can't travel. So right. I let my classical figures travel for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and just so people understand what the visitors, uh, visitors to Singapore series? Visitors of Singapore. Visitors of Singapore yeah. series. Can you just describe what that was? So basically, it's about me reimagining classical figures from their time periods and then photoshopping them. And, uh, reimagining them as these modern day influencers interacting um, in Singapore, like the uh, drink stall auntie or sleeping in the back of the bus, you know, all these 
quirky, quirky scenarios that we all yeah. can relate to. But then there's a bit of a, uh, an edge to it because they are classical figures from a different time period and a different cultural zone as well, like a Western versus an Asian. My favorite one that I saw of yours on your feed was the, was it Saturn eating his son? Bubble feet one, right? <laughs> With, yeah. That work of art is known as being one of the darkest, it most is. horrific it pieces is. of artwork ever. And then you've got, <laughs> you've got Saturn, instead of eating his son, he's got a bubble oh, tea yeah. and he's looking at a laptop yeah. and he's like freaking out. Yeah. Is there a message, an underlying message throughout your art that you're trying to convey? The main message is mostly, um, mostly this experimentation of combining the different, the juxtaposition between Western and Asian and also modern, uh, the pre-classical -class period and modern mm -hmm. modernity. So the goal was actually to sort of free them from the clutches of the white cube. You know, how they're, they're trapped in galleries or the frames that they have once lived for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And now they are just free to, I guess, claim their own lives in social media and where they roam freely and um, other people can narrate these memes, mm -hmm. I guess, in their own different ways. So I get the power of memes is where it's the concept is at because like once one narrative of my work could be another narrative for another person mm -hmm. uh, you don't really get that for uh, that particular original piece of art because it's been set in stone by galleries and museum and it has been um, canonized as such but then with the work that has been transported into social media and these collages um, users have the freedom to um, re narrate them and make it their own essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the, the concept comes from. It's like these characters from these famous pieces of work can go and hang out and yeah. be in other places. I mean, no matter, even though they are from different time zones, mm. there's aspects to them that we can relate to. There's lust, there's all these other emotions, even though they are mm. from a different time zone, we can relate to them somehow. They enjoy a, a glass of beverage or Right. Lustful desires, we all have been there somehow. Or like so. the Mona Lisa can hang out on a bus in Singapore or, yeah. or something like yeah. that. Or work from home. <laughs> like, you know, all these expressions, they are so solemn and funny at the same time, mm -hmm. but it's also relatable. That's why I like to use those because um, it, it just reflects that true emotion mm -hmm. that we tend to hide or take for granted. A lot of your work is seems to have a comical element, but then there's yeah. some of them where mm -hmm. you really stop and yeah. think. It's very thought-provoking. Yeah. When you're deciding which components to combine, do you put a lot of thought into that? Is there reasoning behind it? Like this particular piece means this, and if it's here, it signifies this. Most of it is more of the technical side in terms of trying to find the right composition mm -hmm. and the angles and the lighting to fit in the photography. Because there's like a two process. Like the first process is me looking through the um, paintings and then finding the right um, photo to pair with them. Mm -hmm. The other one starts from the photography and then try to find uh, what kind of figure can I fit into this piece. Um, that's the technical side. But when it comes to conceptual, I need to put a lot of thought into it, it was the Black Lives Matter series. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, that was important because that was a realization that most of my works have been uh, Euro-American figures, mm -hmm. you know, that's been featured there. But during that period, you know, I, I feel that I had to, you know, to do something because um, majority of the um, colored um, people in classical paintings were mostly slaves or helpers mm. and all that. They were depicted that way. So I wanted to sort of, um, I don't say liberate them, but sort of allow, allow them to be a part of the movement, have these figures um, be recontextualized to a, a message that is more powerful and more meaningful to them in this current period. And it's amazing how um, some paintings um, that I've, I've used, I'll, I'll show you one of them, that they were, they were this um, guy who's incarcerated in, in a jail, and it was in the 1800s, but it, the, the painting itself, it's so relevant today, mm -hmm. I mean, mass incarceration. So it's super powerful, and I had to do it, and it was all black and white, so beautiful, and um, thankfully, it, the reception was good as well for that. Have you had reception that was a little bit more mixed with some of your artwork? Like, what have you done that's been kind of controversial? The only one thing that I've had a few, a few trollers mm -hmm. were was using um, the Raja Var Raja Ravi Varma's paintings. He's a famous Indian painter mm -hmm. in India, obviously. Uh, some of them were a bit insulted, and I used his works because some of them 
uh, very um, in line with their culture. So they will be like, why are you using my culture um, and then putting it in, putting your twist to it? Mm-hmm. So they were like really questioning me and really like trolling hard on that. I was so nervous about it. And what was your response? I didn't have to respond. You just didn't? No. Well, how do you feel about that in general, uh, cultural appropriation? Because obviously this yeah. has become a bit of a hot button issue internationally, especially in places like the US. Yeah. It's very touchy and I, I'm, I'm aware of that, which is why when I do appropriate some paintings, I make sure that it's been credited firstly and also tell the story of the original painting as well. Mm-hmm. So if you, so most of my posts are in carousel format. When you swipe to the, to the left, you can see the original painting and who the artist is by and what's the, what's the main message behind the real painting. So um, being an art history major, I want to educate them a bit on art history in a more accessible way. So it's not just about my work, but it's also bringing art history to them in a more fun, fun way. Backlash that cultural appropriation gets in general. Uh, I mean, a lot of it seems to be fashion oriented. Do you feel that a lot of this is, I don't know, people have a good reason for, for being sensitive with these types of things? Or I does it depend? There's a good reason mm. for it, but there comes the fine line between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. So that's where the, the intent of it or how you explain your work and the motivation, motivation behind a particular piece comes um, into play. It's super important for the audience to know where you are coming from and make sure that the intent is... Um, it does seem like more people are getting offended for just random things. Do, do you feel like there's become this culture of people that are virtue signaling through being offended, being like, hey, you know, I'm cool and right because this hurts my feelings kind of thing. I don't know. I really don't know how to answer this question. Um, I don't know. Just a lot of people are so insulted now, so sensitive. Mm-hmm. But I guess there's a reason for it because now we are being not, we are fed with a lot of information from social media and what's right and what's wrong. So we cannot just accept any information. So we have to be, you have to think critically of mm. what's out there. Anything can be done. And a lot of things has been done, but what's right and what's wrong, we have to question it. So I guess that's where people sometimes take it too far when they question every little nitty gritty details. Or they have the right to do it, obviously. Mm. It's, their own, it's their own right to do so. But um, um, it does go a bit too far when, you know, it's, it just, it sometimes, I just want to create art. Yeah, there's a couple things. I think obviously there's a lack of critical thinking ability mm. uh, that I don't think social media really fosters. No, because it's fun. It's, so it's fun. just, it's, yeah, there's no, nobody has time to yeah. think about anything more critically. It's just, let's look at something. How much does this piss me off? It's either like, like or un, 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 like, unlike. Like or unlike. Hate or love. Yeah. That's it. No nuance. And the right. most it's um, resharing, obviously, to repost on IG story, mm. to and then get some convers- and a conversation going through that. But sometimes after a few weeks, it just stops. Yeah. And that's how fast things are going. And then that's unfortunate that more, more, a lot of serious issues are being left under the rug because of social media, because everything's happening so fast. And then there's so many issues that are being surfaced mm. that need to take precedence. Is there a lot of your identity within your art? Oh, it's. It's about my everyday life, right? Yeah. So it's it's a hundred percent everything that art that I make. It's about it's my own memories, my own feelings, emotions, turmoils, and my own pers- uh, opinion on a particular social issue. You know, whatever I've I've done, I mean, it's the most easiest thing to do. You know, to use your own life story for your art. Mm-hmm. It doesn't it doesn't have to be anything else. It's just that it's this raw emotion that's being used. As an artist here in Singapore. What's been your biggest struggle? I guess to get recognized. Okay. That was the main issue. And thankfully that issue was quickly... <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, since I didn't go to any art school, in terms of obviously art history, I went mm. to LaSalle for that. But what, it, there wasn't any formal training for me. I didn't go to any art school for formal training. So I didn't get a network, original network with mm. artists or lecturers for that. So. Um, my art was born out of social media, so some people really did, don't really see that I'm a serious artist because it, it was from social media. Mm. You know, people call me a social media artist sometimes. So it's like, mm, but I'm actually an artist inside, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, some collectors don't um, 
see the value in some of my work because it's it is just social media work you know those like old school collectors you know mm. they want they are, they are really in, have that traditional mindset so that's where the struggle is because um even though i have plenty of followers on instagram mm. they're mostly um those who support me but don't necessarily um are collecting my works if that makes sense because right. collectors and fans are slightly different obviously fans do buy my work but mm. um uh, the um, collectors are, are the different, I feel. Do you feel like that's starting to change with the rise of NFT popularity? Yeah, because I think that's where uh, our generation are, are coming forth to mm -hmm. uh, buy the works and supporting them. So that's the new, the, the new birth of art collectors, uh, NFT collectors, you know. So how do you feel overall that this new NFT art culture is transforming the world of art? I think it's amazing because it's it skips that middleman of the galleries. Like you, sometimes you need a gallerist or a promoter to sell your work. But now with NFTs, artists have the um, autonomy to create their works and set a price to your work, and it's um, it's good also because you can you can uh, extend your reach to other parts of the globe. You know, it's not just sometimes it's hard for you to sell your work on social media because it's within your friends, um, you know, your, your social circles. But with NFTs, uh, artists can actually um, share their work to another group of people that are not necessarily their um, original, um, social, in their so original social circle. So that's like quite good. Are you giving any thoughts to the possible buyers of the art when you're creating it? Or is it you're just yeah. creating it based on from here? Yeah. When, you, when you create with the thought of the buyer in mind, it becomes like more of a commission already. Mm. You know, you lose the essence of what the art is about. I mean, obviously, sometimes you get driven by the sales and you want to make sure that um, your artwork sells, but you're not selling product, you're selling art. It's different. You still have to, you still have to reflect the time as artists do naturally and not think too much about the buyer. Obviously, sometimes um, it helps, but it shouldn't be your main focus when creating NFTs, especially with NFTs, people are thinking, oh, I should create um, work that are in line with the visual language of NFTs, like um, pixel art or, you know, all these Bitcoin kind of related, um, the visual language of NFTs, but it's good to experiment on that, but not um, change your entire creative um, um, the, the journey just to just for that. NFTs is just a technology for you to like propel your artwork, but not necessarily the main thing. You were saying that you didn't really start to make any of the art until about a year ago. Mm, yeah. So what was it that inspired you to do so? I've been making art before that. I've done watercolor paintings okay. and all that. It was mostly, watercolor paintings was mostly to, um, um, I guess my dad, passed, my dad passed away when I was young and I had to use art to, um, I guess, um, deal with those emotions. So once that mm. settled, I started dealing with digital art. I've always been creating in school or whatnot, wherever wherever I am, I've always been creating. So, you know, okay. it has always been a part of my life. My parents were creative. They've always instilled creativity in the in, in homes, in our home. So it's always been as such. Did the global pandemic influence your art in any way? Oh yeah. Or the process oh, yeah. of creating it? That that actually started the Vistas of Singapore collection mm. because we couldn't go out and you know, because I can't go out, um, I was just trying to find a way to find a narrative for me to deal with this, um, how we negotiate in, through these times, right? So I just thought of using these classical figures to do the traveling for me <laughs> around the globe. Mm -hmm. And people seem to like it because obviously they are at home more, they are on social media more. So you get a lot of negative news around the, um, the pandemic and other stuff. So that was like a good break or a good, like a fresh take on art on social media. Yeah, just being like, oh man, everything is so bleak. <laughs> we got to put a smile on our faces. Yeah. So I, I created the girl with a gas mask. I think that was one of the first yeah. few, the girl the, with the pearl earring mm -hmm. is now wearing a gas mask in one, of the, in one of my works. So people got a good laugh out of that. Mm -hmm. Are there any misconceptions about digital art or NFT art? The main thing that people tend to think that NFT is like a quick way of selling your art, mm -hmm. but it's not. You know, just because you have that autonomy of selling your work as an NFT, you still don't have that galleries or promoter to do it. So all this publicity, you still have to do it by yourself. You know, you can't just put it up on sale and then wait overnight for a sale, for a sale to happen. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. 
unfortunately. You still have to know how to play the game. It's still an art world, essentially. You still need to make sure you do your going to Clubhouse, Twitter, because that's where the collectors are. Most of the mm-hmm. collectors are on Twitter. Go into Discord groups to help you set up your wallets and all that. Make sure you get to in touch with the right group of people because they would know how which platforms to use. Also, just make sure that the work that you do starts from within you and not just because you think that it's a quick way of selling your art. Just gotta make some money, yeah, man. I mean, yeah. but that's where you get all these gimmicky NFTs because mm-hmm. right now it's so saturated in the NFT market because people, um, it's easy. It, obviously, it's good that people, a lot of people are doing it, mm-hmm. but then you get all these gimmicky ones that we are waiting to be flushed away once the. <laughs> <laughs> so that the real collector is... What do you mean by flushed away? I mean like, not the, but obviously the market, the NFT market has been on a dip lately because the, that's where the technological bubble is waiting to, to, it's like getting to pop or something. Yeah. You know, because everything, that's because of the hype from people, right? Everyone's, everyone's joining in the hype. Mm-hmm. But then, obviously, once, you, once, the, once the hype dies down and the sales start to drop a bit, um, that's when I think things starts to um, shift back into mm-hmm. equilibrium, where the serious artists and collectors will stay, and then the the market will get into flow properly again. Because NFT arts, it's something that's here to stay. This is a whole. Oh, it's definitely. Yeah, it's definitely to stay. It's not just like a one month thing. It's so new. There's yeah. so many more possibilities and potential that NFT has to offer, not just for art, but for music, dance, any form of art. It's not just for visual art, mm-hmm. and it's not just for a particular art form. You could imagine uh, fusing them together and selling it as an NFT. This interview could be art. Exactly. This could be exactly. NFT art. There you go. Exactly. Boom. We're creating art That's right it. now. That's it. That's your thumbnail. Art. Art. Josh, you're an artist right now. This is, this is so meta because you are <laughs> recording a conversation about art yes. Yes. as... <laughs> You're creating art with the camera. Okay, that. <laughs> it's like this, this orgy of art happening oh, right now, Josh. Yeah. And you're in the you middle of it. The, <laughs> Hafiz and I are like bookending you oh, yes. in this art orgy. How does that make you feel? Uncomfortable. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for joining us. <laughs> I love your stuff and I really appreciate you meeting up for this interview. Oh, thank you so much. Where can people find your artwork? Just Google the next most famous artist on Instagram, OpenSea for the NFTs, and you'll find me there. Thanks a bunch, Haviz. Thanks Haviz so Kareem, much. the next most famous artist. Pleasure, man. Thank you so much.